be here, and thanks for the uh, invitation. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, managing core resilience across the uh, Eastern Range of Brook Trout, and I'm here representing the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture. And you can see there's a number of other uh, co-authors um, and, and people that have uh, been uh, involved in the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture. And also want to recognize that there's some folks in the room here that have been sort of the founding members of the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture. Doug Stang uh, was there when we started in 2004. And uh, Jim Daly was the representative for New York State, and now it's, uh, it's Fred Henson. So. So here's a quick outline. Um, I'm going to just uh, give you a little bit of history on the joint venture uh, and talk about the subwatershed analysis and uh, cover what is uh, the, sort of the current uh, the current catchment and patch analysis. Talk a little bit about genetics. Um, there's a number of other models and decision support tools tools that are being utilized as the joint venture builds its strategy for resilience for brook trout. And uh, I also want to touch on the economic and social components to resilience. So um, it's interesting with the Adaptive Management Workshop, uh, the joint venture is a good example, I think, of, of evolving or adapting to changes in technology. Uh, we've had uh, an improvement in sort of the resolution of scale that we can look at in these populations across the 17 states that make up the joint venture. And, um, you know, it's continued to evolve, too, in this membership. It has the 17 states, eight federal agencies, um, half a dozen nonprofits, and as we've moved um, into understanding the brook trout, we've gained some new groups, such as the, uh, the group that's focused on salters, you know, in Long Island and Maine. So uh, here's, here's the map, as it was in 2006, of the, the range of eastern brook trout. This is a subwatershed scale, Huck 12. Um, and that was the best available technology at the time. Uh, you can see that the colors, uh, we have intact brook trout populations uh, in dark green and then predicted intact light green. Uh, the, the pink was predicted reduced, red was reduced, gray was extirpated and predicted extirpated. Um, and then the, the hash is sort of an unknown, but uh, the interesting thing was is that, uh, you know, in presence absence, the, this opened a lot of the manager's eyes. And most importantly, I think, it allowed the, uh, the members of the joint venture to perform a gap analysis. You can see all those areas that were unknown. And, and New York State in particular has done a, a wonderful job of filling in the blanks along with Maine and New Hampshire, which of course are, are pretty vast in terms of work trust numbers. Um, so there was a, uh, some interesting information on threats. It was GIS based, but also we interviewed the experts when we went and talked to all the states, and those are the, the state managers, you guys. And, um, and that, that, I think, uh, was incorporated in, in some of the models, and it really opened some people's eyes, and I'll talk about the threats in a second. So fast forward to 2012, um, we started getting into catchments, but, but um, first we, we focused on the subwatershed scale, and you can see the model metrics that analyze a whole host of components or um, metrics, but it turned out that these were the top five that really correlated with brook trout presence, and it's no surprise, percent forest, you know, riparian, deposition, um, and agriculture. So uh, some of the scientists on the joint venture team, sorry it's a little blurry here, but uh, used the CART model and also used the nearest neighbor um, probability, so they wanted to lump together those subwatersheds where you're likely to have brook trout. And so um, they were doing this to, to develop prioritization for protection, restoration, enhancement, and no surprise, you know, you see these large blue areas or areas for prioritization in the north. Um, so it didn't necessarily do everyone a lot of good in terms of prioritization. Um, you can see there's some other areas of prioritization in the Catskills and western Pennsylvania and down through the, the mountains of Virginia and North Carolina. But, um, what was interesting is that, you know, there's, from the host of threats that brook trout face, there's really three groupings, and of course they're all interacting, but uh, it's, it's interesting that, you know, this is all, these have all been touched on by previous speakers, and I think you're going to see a lot of um, recurring themes that I talk about today that have been mentioned by the previous speakers, but it's, for brook trout, the threats are climate change, land use, which is the broad category, of course, with agriculture being sort of the number one, land use, 
across the range of non-native fish. And of course, they're all interacting together because non-native fish or competing fish, of course, are moving north, as we've heard from one of our previous speakers. Um, and if the habitat's degraded, the non-native fish can do better. Um, of course, climate change is impacting habitat and also thermal tolerance and climate change allows us not to be to move. So those are sort of the big three that, that you'll hear more about later. Um, but now we find ourselves with, with much higher resolution. We have catchment level, which I think is the Huck 14, but it's, um, they're sort of one to two mile stream lengths. And we've been able to now use the catchment uh, with fine scale data provided by the states um, to make a finer map. And we're looking at, you know, this for prioritization, we're looking at for status and trends, for tracking these populations, you know. There have been a number of populated populations that are gone from when we first did the modeling um, in 2006. At the finer spatial scale, we can classify these waters by stream reach. So this is really the management unit that, you know, when we built the model with sub-watersheds, they were between 25 and 75 miles of stream. And you know, despite all the actions you might do for conservation in that subwatershed, it's gonna be very difficult to move the, the color of that subwatershed or really change the, um, the classification. But this is really, the stream reach is sort of a manager's unit. And so, of course, it's also gonna enable us to monitor these species at a very fine scale over um, when these one to two mile so just to give you um, a little illustration of, of what it might look like, we have uh, sort of, these are all, sub, these are all uh, catchments, the blue, uh, or where you have uh, allopatric brook trout, um, and then green uh, is where you have uh, brown trout, uh, light green is, uh, no, it's light green is brown trout, green is, is a mix. So, Anyway, the, the way the classification works is you find presence of brook trout, you can move upstream, but you can't move downstream unless you have the identified presence of another brook trout or a barrier. And so that's how the model works. Um, of course, one of the, um, the problems right now is that we don't have good culvert data. So we have dams, we don't have culvert data. So I'm gonna show you what the patches look like right now, which are connected area, connected catchments. It's a very conservative estimate because we don't have good data on barriers for culverts, which of course are ubiquitous, and, and most of those don't pass fish. So as part of the catch analysis, we developed these, patch, these patches, which is just a surrogate for metapopulation. You combine the catches, um, I'm sorry, the catchments, to develop your patch. And um, you can see here the different, um, the different patches, they are, <coughs> They are separate populations, so that's what a patch is. And here's what uh, some of the information we have just at a state level in Virginia. You can see it has, um, Virginia is shown to now have 1,800 catchments of brook trout, where they're allopatric, that means it's only brook trout. And there's about 500 of those, uh, 500 additional catchments that have brook and brown, or brook and rainbow trout, so there's some patch populations. And then there's about 450 catchments with only those brown or rainbow trout. So it paints an interesting picture in terms of uh, the competition that brook trout are facing, facing in Virginia. Um, in Pennsylvania South, one of the interesting things that is, is that uh, only 11% of the catchments are now occupied by allopatric brook trout. So in the former model at the higher resolution, the higher scale subwatershed, it was, uh, you know, between 25 and 30 percent occupied. And this, of course, if we zoom in, we find out that no brook trout have, have lost even more ground than we might have thought when we use the catchment analysis. So these patches, they're contiguous catchments occupied by wild brook trout. I talked a little about how the model works, and um, they're not con they're not connected physically. You can see that. You know, the brook trout, they're limited sometimes by water quality or, or competing species or warm water. Um, and they're assumed to be genetically isolated populations. So uh, when we look at the number of patches across the eastern range now, these are really sort of the unique populations, or at least they're 
they're separate populations across the eastern range of brook trout, we have uh, 6,124 patches of allopatric brook trout. Um, and the really interesting thing is most of those, 78%, are less than 350 hectares. So they're small. 80% of the brook trout patches that are, that are left right now in the eastern range are you know, less than a mile, less than a mile and a half. Like, of course, these larger patches are where you'd expect to find them up in Maine, northern New Hampshire, parts of northern New York. But the question now is, um, well, it, and also you can see that there's uh, 3,800 patches of sympatric brook trout, where their brook trout are living alongside brown trout and rainbow trout. So this information uh, is great for managers and it, and it gives us a lot of questions now. Um, we're going to use the catchment data you know, which are used to build the patches to see how these change over time. So we have this fine resolution. We can see, first of all, do those sympatric brook trout patches stay the same or are they constantly moving? You know, in different states, it's a different story. In North Carolina, if two rainbow trout get in a brook trout stream, those brook trout are gone in three years. There's no stopping them. Whereas in New York here, there's plenty of populations where brook trout and rainbow trout coexist. So it's going to be fascinating to watch at the catchment level and patch level of, of how these species interact, how these populations do. But what is the minimal viable patch size? Uh, conventional research says that you know you need a minimum breeding population of about 500 adults. That was done on cutthroat. Um, and in terms of length of stream, you know it varies between I think six and 12 kilometers, six and 15. What's the average size of the patch with, with that minimum breeding population, if we, if we are to believe that data, at 500? And then as we further develop the data on culverts, how is that information going to reduce our patch size? So there's, just, there's so many questions right now with this new information. And luckily, we have a pretty robust monitoring plan. There's 70 patches within the Chesapeake Bay watershed that are going to be monitored. Annually, and there's 25 of those are sentinel sites. So, those 75 will be for 70 patches. Uh, 45 of those will be monitored once every five years, and 25 are monitored every year. So, that's going to give us a lot of good information. Another important component of this prioritization that the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture is doing is genetics. And we heard from uh, Matt Hare today about um, all the work that Cornell's doing, there's two basic things that uh, the genetics is, is, gonna, um, is gonna tell us. Estimates on the amount of genetic diversity within a patch, and, and that is linked to relative abundance, and please don't ask me how, because the geneticists are way smarter than me, uh, but he can explain that to you. Um, we're also looking at uh, this uh, N sub B, which, uh, gives you the number of individual brook trout that are contributing. So that's sort of a surrogate for effective population size. So the genetics information can be used to tell you how many of one year class, uh, how many parents contribute to that year class. And so just on the left, you'll see you have a higher N sub B of 20, where you have, um, you have 10 uh, adults, um, and they're all contributing evenly to the offspring. And then on the right, you have lower N sub B where you have 10 adults or 10 pairs and they're contributing very differently to, the, uh, to that next population. So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of interest in pursuing the genetic analyses for what they can do in terms of both um, relative abundance and effective population. So here's just um, an illustration here of uh, part of Virginia and you can see uh, these are different patches and the green are, have a high, a quite high effective population. The N sub B between 150 and 230, and then goes down to red being the lowest from five to 25. So five to 25 individuals contributing to the population. And you can see here that there's quite a bit of variation in terms of the patch size. You know, some of those populations with very low effective breeding populations are found in pretty decent size real estate. Well, you might have some of those much smaller patches that have, um, you know, over 100 
reading um, parents. We also can use uh, the uh, genetics information to give us estimates on population resilience, both in time and space. And so here on the left, you can see um, there's, there's time on the, on the x-axis and then abundance, effective number of breeders. On the right, you can see there's two. Um, you can see one population here. The effective number of, of breeders is, is really going up, but um, it's not really affecting the abundance. And then the graph on the right, you can see that when you're above the, uh, the line here, the resilience of, um, of these populations is good. And when you're below, they're, they're much less, they're much more susceptible. And you can see that the breeding population, the effective breeding population here, is quite low. These red triangles, if you can see them, those are brook trout populations that are sympatric with other, um, with other salmonids. And on the left, you have the two allopatric brook trout populations. They're very resilient in terms of effective breeding populations. And then you have um, other allopatric. Oh, I'm sorry, these are allopatric populations that where the habitat's been remediated. So, you know, this isn't a surprise to you that um, that the work you do out there to uh, to improve habitat populations has a benefit for the population, but this is a way to measure if indeed the habitat work we're doing is impacting the effective breeding size of those populations. So there's also a, a number of really interesting models uh, that have been developed and, um, and efforts. And one of those is this uh, Chesapeake Bay riparian um, prioritization tool where they, um, they're looking at the Chesapeake Bay and they're trying to uh, determine the sensitivity and vulnerability of, of, um, of landscapes and of catchments and patches to climate change. And so they incorporate into the model slope, elevation, aspect. They used a, a lot of paired air water temperature thermographs um, to determine which of these streams are more groundwater dependent than runoff dependent. And they also look at riparian condition, of course. And so you're able to categorize um, a patch or a catchment into an area of, is it low sensitivity and high vulnerability to, um, to water temperature is high sensitivity and high sensitivity and high vulnerability. You know, you're, you're going to want to invest your riparian reforestation efforts in areas that are, um, you know, maybe low sensitivity and, and uh, low vulnerability. So this is just one of the one of the tools out there, and that's done in coordination with the Appalachian LCC and the Northeast Climate Northeast Climate Science Center. Um, Another model, which I really encourage you all to, to take a look at, if you if you haven't, is has been developed by USGS and, and some other partners, um, including Forest Service, and it's called Ecosheds.org, and it has all this information that I've shared with you on the catchment and patch level for brook trout across the range. Um, it has the riparian prioritization or riparian planning tool. Um, they're going to be adding in uh, culvert information in terms of prioritization, but but what it does is it's it's an interactive platform, uh, web-based, and you can you can pull up data, um, you can pull up your fish data, and you can look at your um, all the scores of your of your watershed. I'm sorry, of your catchment, and it creates a and plots a number of histograms, and you can compare the scenarios. So um, it's it's a really fascinating tool to use to find out where to prioritize. Um, you know, our investments for resilient brook trout populations. So another another effort that's been ongoing that's being incorporated into the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture sort of strategy for resilience is this uh, conservation portfolio approach by Trout Unlimited. And the conservation portfolio approach is modeled after the financial portfolio approach, which is basically you want to reduce risk and you want to make sure that you're investing um, in something with a good return. And so uh, it, it uses a number of themes that you've heard about today in terms of resilience for, for populations. Um, it tries to ensure that you have, for a given trout species, you have representation, meaning you have geographic representation, you have populations at the northern and southern extent of the range or different sub-basins. 
um, but you also have representation of different life histories and also of the genetic variation. Um, you're, it also focuses on resilience, which is basically having you know robust populations that can withstand these um, you know these these stresses or um, and that can recover from stresses as we've heard about and. Uh, the approach also focuses on redundancy, so you have multiple populations. So if you lose one, uh, you don't lose that genetic material, or you, you know, you're going to have multiple populations around. Um, so if you lose one, you don't impact the species itself. So given given all of that, um, the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture has developed a set of six strategies, which aren't going to be much of a too much of a surprise to anyone. But but the first one is increase recreational fishing opportunities. And uh, that's important to note because the joint venture itself was started back in 2004 as the first National Fish Habitat Action Partnership. And the goal of these partnerships, and there's now, I think there's 20, uh, is to develop fishable populations. And so, you know, that's our core base in, in many places for these salmonids, certainly for brook trout. You know, restoring fishable populations, and so that's one of the goals of the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture. Um, and just to add that the Forest Service, where I work, is trying to um, figure out how to do an assessment of fishable populations or, or your best recreational fishing populations for all all fish across the national forest system. So there's just a lot of people thinking about this, um, about the, the value of recreational fishing in this whole story of resilience. Their second strategy is to protect the best of the best. Um, and that, of course, is going to mean those large patches where you have good, effective breeding populations as determined by your gen genetics analysis. Those are going to be um, where you're going to focus your protection. However, that's going to happen with um, regulations or with land trusts or with just education. Third strategy is improve and reconnect adjacent habitats. Uh, we've heard a lot about that today. You know, aquatic connectivity is a very fragmented landscape, as you know. There's roads and culverts and dams and, and, other, um, and other things that are fragmenting the population. And of course, we need to prioritize our investments in those places where it's gonna make a, make a difference. So um, the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture has focused on a, a majority of its funding, which it gets through Fish and Wildlife for the last say four or five years on reconnection projects and a lot of those have been culvert upgrades some small dam removals the fourth strategy is focus on uh, wild brook trout spawning and early life history uh, in those sub watersheds classified as intact they need to change that to patches but um, that's a that's a no-brainer we've heard a lot today about recruitment and how important that, important that is to populations and the fifth is preserve genetic diversity of eastern brook trout. And we've also heard a lot about that today. And the sixth is to conserve these unique eastern brook trout life history strategies. And just to remind people, uh, you know, brook trout are extremely plastic in terms of their ability to survive and occupy different environments. You have lake, you have large river, you have salted brook trout, which are anadromous, you have um, the ability for all these fish to survive in these very tiny populations in the headwaters. And they've been doing that for a hundred years in some places. So, um, you know, one of the important uh, components to resilience, I think a lot of us now agree, is, is, uh, is combining the ecological with the social. And, and I think, you know, um, George's presentation was a great example of that and how um, focusing on connectivity projects alone just for the benefit of the beautiful brook trout on the, in the lower uh, right isn't going to sway a lot of people but when you start talking about um, making sure the roads don't blow out and um, that they can survive the storms that we've had like Irene and Lee um, that, that's when you get real buy-in from the public and you have multiple benefits so here's a uh, on the left is a diagram just showing uh, that there's a strong correlation between e ecological connectivity and flood resiliency and it, I mean it makes a lot of sense but you start at the bottom and you have a small hydraulic design pipe it's undersized it's low ecological and low flood resilience um, and then as you move up into the middle you sort of have the um, geomorphic design and then 
the second from the top you have stream simulation design, and at the top you have a full span that spans the whole floodplain. Of course, there's different costs associated with that, but but I think there's a there's a lot of um, different groups now that are recognizing that the two are linked. And in fact, uh, you know, we all experience this um, in different places, but here in New York, I know that that Tropical Storm Irene was a huge event, and in Vermont, it was even bigger. And you can see. Uh, you all know the numbers of how many culverts, you know, they lost 500 culverts and bridges. But one of the interesting things is when we did a study with a lot of great partners, including the state of Vermont, Nature Conservancy, and um, American Rivers, that in Vermont, they they looked at 1,500 culverts. Well, 90% of those were impassable to fish. They were barriers. And when we looked at the White River Subbasin, 45 culverts <coughs> washed out, and 15 of those were fish passage barriers. And so. Um, it's no surprise when you look at the size of the pipe that are designed for a 25-year flood and you had a 500-year flood where, you know, the stream simulation designs that we had just installed on the forest um, are designed to pass greater than a 100-year flood event. And in fact, they passed a 500-year flood event with no damage. And so, you know, there's, um, there's a strong link here and I think a lot of, a lot of people are, are thinking along these same lines. You know, the, the other important um, Part of this whole story is building social support. And what's your what's your resiliency in terms of public support, in terms of political support, in terms of funding? And so, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. Here's some. These are just some pictures of a, that are from a film that the Forest Service did with Freshwaters Illustrated that features Trout Unlimited in uh, Tennessee, an effort to restore the Southern Appalachian brook trout. And, there's a number of other groups like Backcountry Horsemen and other Boy Scouts you wouldn't necessarily think would be involved, but um, it's a it's a really big um, effort to basically they're growing Southern Appalachian brook trout for the first time in hatchery and restocking them in some of these streams that are now recovered, um, and they're having a lot of success. and And the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture um, is working on their own film over the next two years with Freshwaters Illustrated, and it's going to be about 30 minutes, and it's going to look at the story of the brook trout across the Appalachian Range. And it's going to be more about the people and the subcultures, because you know how many strange fishermen there are out there <laughs> that have evolved you know, with the brook trout from the mountains of Georgia up through the Catskills and Adirondacks and up into Maine. And so um, it's sort of a novel approach, but I, you know, they're really excited about it. And hopefully New York will have a, a piece in that film. So finally, this is my last slide. Uh, there's been a, there was a lot of talk this morning from Brian about broadening the audience and enlisting new partners, and I think the joint venture has done a pretty decent job of, of doing that. Um, on the left, you have Trout in the Classroom, a flagship educational project with Trout Unlimited and a number of other groups um, that are now raising brook trout, um, and using that uh, as the foundation for their curriculum and get kids connected to to water and nature. And and on the right is a is a poster that the joint venture put together that really expands beyond the normal fish talk. They're talking about uh, the partnership and the challenge, but these are all the projects that they've helped fund and been involved in, and these are all the, the funds that were raised, and, and that this work created $200 million in economic activity. You know, there's an economic story to this restoration economy that's slowly building. And there's also talk about uh, providing a buffer against flooding, and that their tagline, which I think is really interesting, is healthy waters equals healthy people equals healthy economy. So, you know, um, out west, there's a lot of partnerships that are having developing with the Forest Service, the provision of water, the ecosystem services, you know, brook trout, and many of these other fish are the sentinel species. And so, uh, you know, we really think there's a lot broader base of partners that we can get on board um, in terms of developing a resilient brook trout population. Thanks.